Welcome to Brandon Hall Group's Excellence at Work podcast. You will hear from industry leaders covering innovative, cutting edge business, learning, and HR topics that weave current market research and technology into each episode. Our Excellence at Work podcast is hosted by Brandon Hall Group's Chief Operating Officer and Principal HCM Analyst, Rachel Cook. Hi, and welcome to Brandon Hall Group's Excellence at Work podcast. Today, I have with me Kelly Hale, the Vice President of Delphin Logic, and Rahil Mehtani, the Associate Vice President in Learning Content Design Development from Delphin Logic. Hello. Hi, Kelly, and hi, Rahil. How are you both? Thank you for having us. Hello. Thank you for having us. Doing good. Great. And today we're going to be chatting about managed learning systems. And we have some, um, I think it'll be an interesting conversation, um, learning about both of your perspectives and some examples from some of the clients that you're working with and what you're seeing in the industry. Um, Also wanted to share um, with our audience today um, a little bit about Deaf and Logic and um, also um, congratulations on the Brandon Hall Group Excellence Awards that you have received over the last couple of years. Um, just within uh, 2022, you received eight Learning and Development HCM Awards. So congrats. Thank you. And, uh, and a Tech Award as well, uh, a gold one and several other gold. And, and uh, so that's fantastic. And uh, thank you also for being part of our uh, HCM Excellence Conference that we hosted uh, about now it's about a week ago, so we were just uh, chatting um, about the experience, and we were very excited to to be able to host our conference again uh, post pandemic. So it's been a couple of years, and it was refreshing seeing you and um, in our community and all the great you know different leaders and um, companies from all over the world. We had. We had companies from over 25 countries, not to mention nationwide in the U.S. So it was um, we were grateful and thank you for being part of it. Yeah, it was fantastic. Even my boss came in from India. Um, It was just a great, great, great show. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And uh, we're looking forward already for next year. You know, isn't that isn't that something, you know, and I think it's timely of, of, of like kind of where we are in the world. You know, it's. It seems like what we do today, it's nice, but then we already have to be thinking about what's next, right? What's next for the future of work? What's next for technology, um, you know, learning, um, as we are all avid learners. And that's what we're trying to instill in our employees, in our children, um, some of us that do have children. You know, I think the, the, the best advice that we could give um, today's youth is to, is to, um, always be curious and always be wanting to learn because if you have the desire to learn, you will continue to evolve. And we've seen that how important it is to evolve, to evolve in, um, and adapt, um, not just with technology, but with your process, your ability, your capabilities, your skills. And so, and that's what a lot of what, the work you do at Delphin Logic, right? And how you help your customers and how you innovate and how you create solutions or help them create solutions that um, enable them to be successful. So um, I think it's, you know, let's go ahead and and I would love to hear from Kelly, what, what, um, what are managed learning systems or learning services? Yeah, so it's a little bit of a long answer, but bear with me. Um, so, you know, and the reason why is because managed learning services or MLS for short, um, it's really evolved in its definition and scope, much like everything else has in L and D, right? Um, so it kind of helps to view MLS in a historical and current state. Um, within the industry, but I pulled out a really interesting statistic and I have it here and um, there's this fascinating business impact of the MLS market in the sources, services, external training sources, L&D administration and others, global analysis 2022 to 2031 by the transparency market research. And it tells us this, 
In 2021, the MLS industry was valued at US $372 billion. However, by, and let me get my notes here, but the estimated CAGR growth is a whopping 5.4% per year from 2022 to 2031, which then pulls us up to almost a $624 billion market by the end of 2031. Wow. I think that's just fascinating to see, you know, how that is on that business side of the growth. So then it kind of unpacks, well, why, well, what is it, what's happening? Why this momentum, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, so the MLS model that most of us are familiar with, what is it? Customized operational framework to suit the budget of the organization, yes. Enhancing training effectiveness, yes. Cost reduction, 20, 40% reduction in costs when done right with a vendor, also yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Still true, but the type of work we are doing in this model is changing. And that is all because of skill gaps that we're talking about nonstop in our industry, right? So all those organizations that we know are so highly concerned about addressing their employee skill gaps internally. Uh, you know, the public speaking, data analysis, critical thinking, leadership, communication, and so on. Um, and of course, coupled as with the shift to remote work, has put the modern organization in a really stressful place. You mm -hmm. know, how do you continue to focus on new solutions and your pace of business is continually changing all the time? Um, and for a specific example, um, in the uh, FSBI space, so financial services, banking, insurance, um, there's so much extraordinary change and continuous adoption just to enhance their own customer experience that the internal L&D teams just cannot keep up. There's so many bright, shiny objects out there and models. It's hard mm -hmm. for one organization to understand, well, what is working and what is not working? And so that value of vendor and that MLS model comes into play um, when you have so many use cases and experience that you can kind of uh, pull from. Sure, and this leads us to how the MLS, um, how it's changed over time. And, you know, as you mentioned, there's so much out there and, and there's a lot of great things out there and, you know, but it's not necessarily a good fit for everyone. Right. So how, mm -hmm. um, you know, with execution and scope, how do you, um, you know, what do we, you know, from a learner or, or learning professional, you know, how, how do we make all, um, sense of all of this? Yeah, and I wish there was a magic wand, and I think it's a great question, and I think it helps to go back just a little bit into how it has changed, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, historically, you could almost view MLS model as a capacity augmentation versus a capability structure. Um, you know, we used to just run out of hands. How do we do this work that's coming down into the business? So, you know, major workload comes in, not enough internal staff to produce it. So you have your MLS uh, historic model comes into play. Let's take that off your hands. We can scale up, we can scale down. We'll go ahead and, you know, produce whatever it is that you need to do. Whereas now we see that MLS structure much more consultative and transformational. So there's more of a side-by-side -side collaboration with the MLS vendor and the client. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and partly that's also that skills gap within that L&D team. It's really hard to continually to staff up your L&D team to make sure that you have the right type of person right then, right there, when a project comes in, you know, somebody who's, who's you know, uh, can do talk and draw or a narration expert or translation expert and animation. It was really hard to keep those skills and those fresh skills, you know, on staffed correctly at all times. Um, so, and I think to end, it's really where the client was more prescribing work Mm -hmm. We now see that collaboration, 
right? And Rahil will go into some real life uh, examples of one of our clients who did this, went through this transformation. But now it's really these type of conversations that I'm having and we're having in the business right now is really more about, we're discussing like business drivers, performance, mm -hmm. learning goals. How do we tie those to the business? How do we weave in the analytics, utilizing content design, best practices, um, alongside the traditional development and delivery that we know in the MLS model. Sure. Um, yeah. So it is interesting um, that you say the, the relationship between the customer, the client and the solution provider, the partner, um, even that like leadership styles have changed where it, it has become more collaborative between the leader and their teams. And so even in the nature and the way we work with our partners, it has that same, I feel, um, transition to how we interact with each other in a much more collaborative uh, way. And then I think that lends itself to more innovation and creativity and more inclusion for, you know, hearing are, are gaining different perspectives and voices and, and so forth. And I'd love to hear from Rahil, um, if you can share, you know, an example of, of a client or a project and what that looks like. Sure. Thanks a lot. So, uh, let me begin by first, you know, uh, telling you what, what an MLS engagement looks like compared to a one-time project, which we normally do. So uh, what do we know about a one-time project? It's where we send out a proposal with a defined scope, deliverables, and timeline. And then we put together resources to meet those. And over a period of time, if there are any modifications in scope, this would imply a change request. MLS is not that. So with an MLS, we put together a scalable team that seamlessly integrates with and augments an organization's existing L&D team. And uh, when I say augment, I don't imply just simply resource augmentation. At Delphin Logic, we go beyond and provide capability augmentation. That is by aligning our team to the existing LND team, we take upon the same responsibility and ownership of the quality output as they would. And with that being said, the MLS team can continuously evolve and scale with the learning needs and strategy of that organization. So to understand this better, let me take you back when Delphin Logic first started its MLS journey, quite unknowingly though. Uh, one of our clients, a US-based retail organization that has a large brick and mortar and e-com presence across the globe, employing more than 2.3 million associates, uh, their L&D team was moving from a decentralized to centralized setup. And at that time, the internal L&D team was finding it very difficult, getting the right resources and, you know, just building up their team to manage all that, all the work coming in through those various verticals, which were now coming together. So uh, they required resources who could dive in immediately and uh, start working on whatever they had at that point of time. So when, uh, during one of the sales meet, when Mandit Goel, our founder, director, and the account owner of this particular client, when he got to know about this requirement, uh, he realized that, you know, we as the solution providers couldn't go the regular route of, you know, how we would with just another one off project. More so because the client wanted total control over timeline, design solutions and processes. That's when he and our other directors came up with the idea of putting together an augmented team that would align with the client's l and team and uh, put to pick up projects as they got prioritized and greenlit. So uh, SOW was put in place that defined the specific skill sets required, number of resources that are defined hourly rate. And uh, it was then decided that every quarter the SOW was revisited and the skill sets and the number of resources would be reconfigured based on the projection of work. So you see this setup seemed like a perfect answer for the given scenario where the project pipeline was fluid, a, sign a significant amount of work was projected, but no one exactly knew when it would kickstart. And when it did, it needed to be done pronto without any administrative hurdles. So uh, this was way back in probably 2018 when Delphin Logic began its first MLS journey. 
And when we put together this team, it was a team of five instructional designers. I was the senior ID on that team. Uh, and I was engaging with the clients to understand their requirements that comprised of flash to HTML conversions, content updates, job aids, the very basic level one work. And uh, there was plenty of work. And within a few months, the team grew from five to 10 resources. And at one time we were 35, both instructional designers and graphic designers. So wow. you see, uh, there was this ease of scaling the team as work ebbed and flowed, which is a very uh, important feature of an MLS sure. setup. That's so, mm -hmm. right. No, fascinating. And, and you can see how you were able to scale as the business needed you to. So that's really important. Is, is this how you would define an agile mindset in the terms of ML, MLS? Uh, MLS. Right. So, yeah. So we uh, kind of discovered that working in the typical uh, traditional waterfall method wasn't the most ideal way of going about with an MLS setup. Mm -hmm. Because, like I mentioned, the team size increased, the type of projects which were coming in also were becoming more interesting. It, they weren't the level one kind of work anymore. And we were also moving from the very prescriptive way of working to a more consultative way of working with the clients, collaborative. And we needed some more, a more defined structure in place. So while we were working now on videos and micro learning nuggets, classroom trainings and motion graphics, and it wasn't just about scripting and developing, we were ideating and providing solutions to the team. And the skill sets also kept uh, evolving, and we were to meet. We were able to meet all of this because we had a strong team of designers, and uh, that's when uh, I guess it it became important for us to move towards a more collaborative process. So when when this project started, the internal team at uh, the organizations at the client's end. Uh, they were also trying to figure out what's the best way to work. Uh, and that's when they, I think, were, ex were, were trying to experiment with the agile way of working. And it worked well for them. However, for our offshore clients, uh, for our offshore uh, resources, which is us, we were still relegated to using our waterfall methodology. And... Uh, as a senior ID on the team, I was finding it a little challenging keeping up pace with the uh, with the organization. And uh, that's when I suggested that, why don't we also align with the agile methodology? So that took a little bit of convincing whether, you know, it would work or not, because obviously of the time difference and the fact that we had never worked in an, an agile environment mm -hmm. and we needed to be trained also. So uh, that's when I stepped out from my senior ID role and took up the role of a project program manager. And uh, I, I, I understood the entire Agile setup. And from there, I kind of like brought it down back to my team and set up the entire team to align with the client's uh, uh, Agile setup. So. Um did it take you to shift your thinking or your, your approach? So it was a very, uh, you know, ongoing process. I mean, I, I guess for me, it wasn't very difficult probably because uh, me and another senior team member, it wasn't very difficult because we had learned about agile being in the industry for quite some time. Sure. However, to uh, get the entire team working on that, agile, on that agile mindset took a while, but I think now, uh, we're, we're in a better, much better place than where we started. So yeah, it's continuously evolving. So sure. that's what, you know, and, uh, with agile, uh, the mindset is all about aligning to collaboration, learning cycles, taking ownership and having the ability to adapt to change. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when we deliver a product, we deliver it in a way that is adaptive, incremental and iterative. I mean, these are the key tenets of another agile way of working. So when we say adaptive, it means, you know, uh, 
working with small items of work that allow the customer to revisit their requirements. If it's incremental, we are allowing them to, we, it's, it's allowing the product to be built incrementally. The product is demonstrated to the customer frequently to get their feedback. So we mm -hmm. can converge on a business solution and it's iterative. The team produces in small cycles, building on what has already been delivered before. And, and once this allows, mm -hmm. so this allows for incorporating changes in direction, even late in the process, as well for accounting for stakeholders feedback throughout the process. And once you, um, once you kind of change your mindset and your approach and you adopt this type of, of learning approach, it does make it much easier for you and for your clients to, to be able to reiterate changes, um, uh, uh, you know, support the business as they need, you know, to provide learning at the right time in the right area. So it is much, once you have this shift, um, change and shift or change management also, it'll be a greater advantage for you and, and for your, your customers. And we've, you know, we keep hearing that from, you know, the numerous examples and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of examples of what companies are experiencing um, with this effort or mindset. Yeah. What are some of the pitfalls with um, MLS um, that you should be looking out for and, and how do you handle those? So I'll take this one. I think it's a great question. So, you know, working with a vendor is just never, you know, 100% easy, right? You know, uh, you have that, you know, that control, um, loss of the learning curve. In other words, you know, how am I keeping track of what is, you know, working, what is not working? Um, you know, the fear of quality, is it going to be, are the deliverables and, and go live? Is it going to look exactly like I envisioned it in my mind? Is it going to hit the business drivers? You know, are we going to be successful in this product? You know, and uh, to Rahil's point, that agile mindset, that that's not the easiest thing for some companies to embrace. And, you know, it's like, well, if we don't work agilely, how, how will this work? And it's like, well, we'll kind of help you create the version or vision of agile that's going to work the best for your particular company. So if it's, you know, daily standups, great. If it's a weekly standup, fantastic. You know, what makes the most sense to you all to ensure that we are, you know, making sure that those, you know, the Q and A is done correctly. Um, has our goals been met? What's the progress that we have done together? What changes do we need to make because something didn't work or something worked really well and we need to kind of continue to do that. So it's really about kind of putting together that communication cadence so that everyone feels comfortable, you know, the reporting and things like that. And then at the end of the day, it's really about trust. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're trusting somebody like a vendor like, like Delphi and Logic to kind of come into your organization and become almost a coworker. You know, you you make you make these like deep friendships and things with with clients mm -hmm. over time, right? And so you kind of forget that you know you may work here and we work here. It really becomes um, that that moment of trust to do Absolutely. the art. We yeah. we have the same same concept or same um, uh, how do you call it? I guess how we how we position ourselves or how we um, describe our relationship is we're really an extension of your team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, instead of maybe hiring 30 more people, you're hiring, a, you know, you're getting your, your entire team or, you know, instead of hiring two full-time people, you have, you have 30 plus whatever, you know, minds to help you with your, your work. So, and that's what your core competencies are in. And um, it's just really, you're, your goal is to try to help them be better. And so when you develop that type of relationship and you have that trust, it makes the experience, um, you know, in just, you know, immeasurable. It really does. And I think it really comes down, you know, like human to human, right? Um, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times, you know, we've picked up the phone or I picked up the phone and I'm like, and somebody's like, I have this big project. I, I'm very overwhelmed. Uh, I, I really need some help. It's like, okay, let's try to figure it out. I got you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Well, as we, as we wrap up, 
Um, and I think, uh, Rahel, you're going to kind of talk us through a little bit about an example of how a project typically turns from an idea to execution. And I think that would be a great way to kind of leave our audience today just kind of with some guidelines and principles of, of how they can move to, to the execution part. Right. I think uh, let's assume uh, we have an existing MLS relationship with the client and uh, over the MLS execution phase, the client realizes they have a project that requires a specific talent that isn't a part of the existing, existing team, both internal and vendors are engaged in that agreement. So uh, what you really need to keep in mind is that you need to keep your ears and eyes open. I mean, just always have these conversations with your client, try to, uh, you know, figure out what are they really looking for? Where is that need coming from? And just have a very open communication channel. And uh, if that's in place, they would definitely reach out to the program manager with the skill set requirement. They would provide you the tentative timelines for the project. And, uh, and when I say that, because most of the times what they do is uh, they try to see whether the talent is within their own L and D team. Uh, so, and even if probably they are looking out for a specific skill, they might, you know, just try to see how best they could do it internally mm -hmm. in place of a very challenging project. So that's when I say that, you know, you have to really communicate well or keep those communication channels open with your client so that you have built your confidence enough in them so that they reach out and they ask you first, Hey, you know, we are not being able to meet this requirement. Do you have this skill set within your team? So yeah, that's, you know, that's how right. you, we need to go about it. And, uh, so let's say, uh, yeah, we do have that specific talent within our team and, uh, you figure out the resources availability and, uh, you talk to the client and tell them, well, Hey, yeah, we do have this resource available who could, or this with the specific skills that you require for the project. And, uh, be very upfront if, uh, the specific skill set is a very niche, uh, skill set. Uh, you know, the resource has very specific or uh, niche skill sets and, uh, it, it requires, uh, a different, uh, hourly rate than what is usually being, uh, you know, uh, prescribed to the other team members and you need to go ahead and prove why, uh, you know, this resource, a specialized skill requires a different hourly rate. So go ahead, provide them samples of the work that the client, uh, that the resource has already done, which aligns with their requirement. And, mm -hmm. uh, most of the cases, yes, they would agree. And, uh, once that's in place, I think, uh, a new SOP, W needs to be put in place. And while it's going on, while, it, while it's going through the formal signing off, uh, introduce a new resource to the client and initiate any training if required, because, uh, if this resource hasn't really worked with the client before or the agile way of working, they need mm -hmm. to be uh, kept abreast with, you know, the agile way of working because most of our other projects, they follow the waterfall method. So it's good to get them a little, uh, acquainted with the agile way of working as a program manager, I'm pretty much there, uh, you know, initiating the discussions between both the, uh, client and the resource. And, uh, when it comes to figuring out what are the tool requirements, what are the systems that are required, you need to, you know, make sure that, you know, uh, those are also discussed well in, well in time before the project really kicks off. And most of the time the client provides you those, uh, the, the, the tools and the systems because we are working on their intranet. So that's something which they would have to provide us. Um, and once the project kickstarts, the new resource integrates with the L and D team. Uh, they attend the standup calls. They work independently with the client to meet the deliverables chucked out every sprint, which is a very integral part of, uh, you know, the agile way of working as a program manager, uh, I don't think one needs to be totally involved in figuring out, you know, every nitty gritty of the project. I think let the resource work independently, let them take the calls and provide that consultative approach towards the work with the client. And, mm -hmm. 
I think everything will just then fall in place. Sure. And I just want to have a clarification. When you refer to resource and the client, what is your um, definition of resource? Uh, is that the project manager? No, this would be an instruction designer. It could be yeah. a graphic designer, a resource okay. in that sense. Yeah. Uh, so stakeholders you know, are part of the project, basically. Right. Okay. Uh, overall, um, you know, in an agile way of working, you you just you probably aren't looking for multiple project managers because sure. of the collaborative way of working. Each resource is. Uh, expected to step up and uh, collaborate and connect with the client and and take ownership of their work so the project mm -hmm. manager is really not somebody who's uh, very uh, uh, 24 7 on the project but sure. a program manager because they're multi the role that i play of a program manager i oversee all the multiple projects running across so that takes up more of Sure. Of, uh, Absolutely. Well, I think this is helpful for um, whether you're a solution provider and you are um, serving clients or are, you know, developing these types of projects and relationships and also from the client side um, as you are looking for partners and what you should be considering what the what this type of environment looks like and um, and those that are already on their way you know this will just kind of add to your your perspective and so thank you Rahel and Kelly for joining me today and sharing your um, you know some insights around the work that you do and again thank you for your partnership we are um, very grateful for the relationship and um, and thanks again for sharing. Take care. Thank you, Thank Rachel. You. Thank you.